Hi, good morning and welcome everyone. This is Seek Sustainable Japan, our sub-series short takes, 30 minutes of topics from Japan uh, focused on sustainability. I'm JJ Walsh here in Hiroshima, joined by... Hi, I'm Tova Kinooka here in Yokohama. And Tova, we have big information, big event coming up next week, and you're going to be able to join. I'm so happy. Um, but I won't tell yet who are the other secret guests. I'll do a big announcement. Um, but mark your calendars, folks. I hope you can join us for a long live 500th episode from 6 to 9 p.m. next uh, Sunday. So a week from Sunday. Wow. It's just unbelievable that I, I could be at amazing. 500 episodes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, what started as, as just sort of an experiment, right? During yes, uh, COVID, yes. nothing else was going on. Yeah. I mean, you've done an amazing job. So oh, to get to 500 and, is phenomenal. And you've been such a great part of it because we do this regular <laughs> monthly 30-minute catch-up. But also we did the Women Inspire event together. And yeah. I think that that helped me connect to so many new people mm, as well. Mm. Every event I go to, I always meet great new people and I want to have them <laughs> on my show and go more in depth, you know? So yeah, it, yeah. No, it's been it's a great brilliant. discovery. <laughs> There's okay. a great network out there of people yeah. doing good stuff. So it's, sure. it's wonderful that you're giving them a platform and a voice. Oh. So. Trying, trying to. It's, it's been a great part of my brand. Uh, you know, like by highlighting other people. And I think we see this in sustainable businesses a lot, right? Yeah. Like how people elevate their own brand by elevating what great work and collaborating with great other businesses, right? Exactly. Because a lot of the time, I think, you know, we, we, we work really hard in our little space wherever we are, um, you know, to, to make the impact. And then um, sometimes it can feel like you're very alone and nobody's listening and, and it's not really having the impact you want. But then when you can connect with others who are doing good things in other places and find opportunities for collaboration, but also just realize that, you know, there is um, a lot going on out there. And it, it's really wonderful to meet those people and get inspiration. So, yeah. Absolutely. So uh, the topics that we're covering on the 500th, I'm going to have different groups of speakers who everybody knows and loves and talking about topics which have been really popular on the uh, show so far. So we're talking about uh, sustainable business. You'll be in that segment in the <laughs> beginning. And then we'll talk um, with a group of creatives in Kyoto. And we're talking uh, about organic farming, sustainable farming. And then we're going to finish with some Minka masters who are talking about renovating and keeping traditions of Japanese houses. So I'm really excited. Fantastic. It's Sounds also good. a technical challenge because I'm going to have to, <laughs> you know, moderate with lots of different groups coming in. So fingers crossed, everything goes well. I love this. I love the way you keep challenging yourself. And <laughs> Pushing the boundaries, it's fantastic. We have to do something <clears throat> special for the 500, right? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> now, you um, want to share about the fabric event that's coming up? Yes, so this is happening on the 6th of July. So our friends at Fabric in Tokyo are doing an event on uh, called Mela, which means a Sanskrit word for gathering or fair, but it um, sort of stands for Mountain Ecosystem Legacy Action. Um, and somebody that you've interviewed, um, Carol Fuchs, who's a climate specialist advocate um, and also professional mountain athlete, will be a big part of that. But there will also be um, other organizations sort of working on um, mountain ecosystem system related um, areas so looking at what's going on there getting understanding but also um, uh, sort of opportunities to support as well so uh, yeah really looking forward to that and it'll be a great community event as well opportunity to connect with people in the sustainability network yeah i wish i could come up for that uh, unfortunately it's right before i'm going home for a while <laughs> Um, so I can't make it to Tokyo, mm. but it sounds like a great event. And James, who is uh, the founder of Fabric, is is one of the people who's joining next week. So yeah, uh, there you go. Out of the there. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure we'll talk about that again. Definitely, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Now you had another uh, reminder about Refugees International. Yeah, so yesterday uh, was World Refugee Day, um, and uh, a bit like sort of World Women or oh, International Women's Day, there's a theme each year. So this was really about sort of solidarity with refugees this time. We're now at the point, I think it's, um, oh, I had the stats somewhere on my um, thingy, we're at 120 million 
currently people globally um, classified as displaced um, that might be displaced in other countries or internally displaced due to conflict through to uh, due to climate issues um, there are a lot of different reasons but um, that's a horrendous number that's the highest it's ever been it's been going up year on year for at least the last 12 years um, and it's yeah, something I think we all need to be aware of, because particularly uh, the big organizations I work with, um, you know, if you look down through the, the value chain, the supply chain, the, you know, there are refugees along that and communities that are impacted by this. Um, and so it really relates to all of us, right? Nobody wants to be in that situation. And sometimes you can think life is all going beautifully and then things can completely turn upside down and all of a sudden, you know, you're on the road um, with <laughs> a bag and nowhere to go. Um, so I think it's really something we really need to be aware of. Um, and I think I'll sort of, I think was also worth highlighting is that when we think of refugees, people often think of the need for sort of immediate aid, um, perhaps sort of shelter and food and things like this. So for example, with the situation in Gaza at the moment, um, then of course that sort of immediate aid is incredibly important. But there are a lot of communities where people have been refugees for years, decades even, that kind of get forgotten. Um, and once it's out of the headlines and that immediate need for perhaps food or something is out of the way, the, these communities just sort of get left there but they can't go home if the conflict whatever is still ongoing um so organizations like rei who i work with um are looking at sort of longer term solutions there so once we've got past that initial crisis how can we sort of support and empower people to get back on their feet and so and make it sustainable as well so it's not sort of the outside agencies coming in and and giving the um, sort of what's needed at that point and that it's a, a sort of a donation that needs to be made again and again. This is sort of finding ways that can uh, people can learn new skills, um, find new ways to support themselves and their families and be part of the, the community they're living in as well. So it makes it that much more sustainable and helps them rebuild their lives and regain their independence. So um, if you're looking for something to do um, to support refugees, go and have a look at that. I think it's well worth um, considering what you can do. Fantastic. Thanks for sharing that. It's so important. Uh, when I do tours of Peace Park here in Hiroshima, mm. there is a monument for the anonymous victim where a lot of the ashes are kept um, right. from people who they couldn't identify before they mm. had to cremate their bodies. And they're still looking for matches. They're still trying to find the families, which mm. is really incredible. Um, there's this monument where it's a face and it usually has water over it. And the idea is if you look into it, you can see your own face with the mm -hmm. anonymous face to kind of have that idea that it could be me. It could be any of us. Yeah, and very much. That's the same for when we talk about refugees. It could be all of us. Exactly, exactly. None of us are immune to this. I mean, things can change very quickly with the geopolitical situation, but also, I mean, with extreme weather events and stuff, if that comes in and destroys your your um area like we're seeing more and more now then all of a sudden you can find yourself with nowhere to go <laughs> no support so yeah yeah so helping mm -hmm. refugees can uh, lead to good karma if some believe in that you know like setting up these good situations uh, which Absolutely. might be something we need in the future too yeah. right like it, yeah. it's not just selfless helping no. other people it, it pays it back uh, yeah. in good ways to us. Yeah. Thank you for all your work in that area, Tova. No, um, no. Yeah. Now, in the news recently, it's a very exciting. You're there in Tokyo. Oh, we yes. have two women leaders in Japan, Koike and Renho, and they are both going for the Tokyo governance uh, job. And it's it's really exciting to see women in politics. I know. Um, it's great. It's great. I would love to see more of this. Hopefully they can inspire others, you know, by, by role modeling what well, role modeling, sorry, what's possible, you know. Yeah, be, absolutely. That's something... And 
Anymore. And some of the key topics of the the race is what they're talking about is, of course, the declining birth rate and how to support working women and how to encourage better family work life balance. You know, all of these really yeah. important social issues that we've been struggling with in Japan for so long. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were just talking before we went live. Neither of us can vote in Japan, even though we're permanent residents. We might live here forever. Um, but it's really exciting to see women leaders talking about these important issues for yeah. everyone. So it's fantastic. Yes, yeah. So, I mean, good luck to both of them. It's, it's just really inspiring to see them both out there, right? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the key differences it looks like is uh, Renho has been bringing up uh, the Meiji Jingu project, for example, that Koike yeah. uh, right. like go like business as usual, but we mm -hmm. need to think about trees. So we have other environmental issues also starting to come in in the debates, which is really important yes. to be yeah. discussing these things, right? Yeah, yeah. No, that's great. I mean, that needs to be on the agenda as well. Of course, there are you know so many issues that need to be looked at. But I think with the the heat you were just mentioning before we went live, I think that you know already it's it's hit thirty five down where you are um, in Hiroshima. This is you know this is way sooner than we would normally expect. Um, and so we need the greenery, every bit of greenery. We need more than we have already. So we shouldn't you know at all be taking any of it out of our cities. We really need that. Yeah, absolutely. Very important. Now, also talking about gender equality, wonderful to see women uh, leading the country and talking about these important issues. Also about diversity, you had a great yes. uh, report from the BCCJ. Yeah, so Robert Walters, um, one of the BCCJ members um, and a very strong sort of voice in Japan for LGBTQ community, um, have announced that they will um, match the social security benefits for same-sex partners of their employees. So um, as I'm sure everyone knows, same-sex marriage is not yet recognized here in Japan. Um, Thailand's just had great results on that, so hopefully that'll move the conversation forward a bit faster here. Um, but it's really great to see companies like that not waiting for the government to, to say, well, you know, same-sex marriage isn't recognized, therefore they can't have the benefits um, that are um, sort of, uh, you know, separate sex um, couple would have, but the company's taking the lead and saying, well, we don't think that's fair. So we're going to top that up and make sure that your same sex partner will access the benefits as well and be able to get healthcare, et cetera. So I think that's an amazing example from Robert Walters. Hopefully that will also encourage other companies to consider doing the same. Um, and also put pressure, I think, on the government to say, look, you know, you're being left behind. <laughs> you're gonna look a bit stupid here. Let's let's move forward into the 21st century. Yeah. Um, I often have uh, same-sex couples coming through and, and guiding them around. And I always say, you know, how do you feel going through Japan? Mm. It's not yet legal in Japan to be a same-sex couple uh, in terms of equal rights. Yeah. And, and they're coming from countries where it is. Mm. And they, you know, these are young professionals often. And they say, yeah, it's, I've often thought about coming to work in Japan. But until it becomes legal, we yeah. can't consider it which is yeah. it's powerful reason for Japan to, to exactly. like now Thailand yeah. has done it, like you've said, the mm -hmm. first in Asia. Asia has really uh, been a little bit slower to make it. I think right. Taiwan also as well is yeah, that's yeah, right. progressive yeah. on that. So, yeah. Um, but they said, mm -hmm. um, you know, even as a young couple I talked to from the Netherlands, they were saying, we feel really lucky to be, young and living in a country now where we are accepted yeah. for who we are and we yeah. can live as we want to live. And mm -hmm. it, just, it was so powerful, you know, and I was like, yes, it's awesome. Because they yes. said even their parents' generation, it wasn't, it no. wasn't accepted. It wasn't easy, right? Hmm. No, it has been very difficult and it's an ongoing battle. I know here, um, you know, uh, Joshua Bryan from Robert Walters has been, you know, a very strong advocate um and we've seen it at pride this year we talked about it a couple of months ago that you know a lot of companies were there um sort of showing their support so i think things are shifting um and really you know with the the population <laughs> decline in japan and stuff we, we really need to address these issues and make sure that it is an attractive working environment a fair working environment for people to come into so uh, 
hopefully progress. Yeah, I hope so. And I think the, the foundation of acceptance is already here. Uh, all of these same sex couples coming through, they say they don't have any adverse reaction when they're checking in uh, to same sex couple having a double bed. It's, it's never yeah. been a problem in Japan. Mm. Um, so that's great to hear that there's already a yeah. kind of an undertow of acceptance. So it's, yeah. we're kind of ready for it. We're ready for the law to change, right? Yes, exactly. For the law to catch up, I think, with public sentiment and, and companies. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And now you had a, an interesting event you went to about corporate governance. Yeah. So this was. Um, a BCCJ event uh, in collaboration with ACCJ, the American Chamber as well. Um, and the moderator there, you can see on the left, Heather Prosser from Moro Sadali. Um, and uh, they were talking about really what, what's going on at the moment in this sort of ESG context, but on the, the G side of that, um, what's happening in terms of governance, particularly um, sort of when we're talking about boards, how aware are boards of the different sustainability issues, um, <clears throat> where is the, the pressure coming on uh, from? Sorry, I'm just going to cough and call me for a Excuse me. Um, so it was really interesting. And um, gender equality definitely came up as one issue that um, in Japan still needs a lot more work. Um, and it was interesting because Melanie Brock, who was there um, on the panel as well, sits on several different boards um, as an external director. Um, and she says very often, she, those boards, it's the, the same women that she sees on different boards. And, and it's great that those women have, have got there and are doing it. And she said, they're all kind of like her, they're long-term in Japan, they're, they're bilingual. Um, and so they can sort of tick many boxes in that sense. Um, but she said, really, we need a more diverse uh, sort of at board level, more diversity board level um, in Japan. And that needs pipeline building as well and also support for women to understand what's uh, required in a board role and how they can find them how they can really sort of make an impact as a board director um, then we were talking about the fact that you know when it comes to the the e part of esg um, a lot of companies still just focus on carbon which is of course incredibly important um, but there's a bit of sort of carbon tunnel vision going on. And we also really need to be talking about other areas like water, like um, soil degradation, like oceans, like, um, you know, the mountain systems that uh, Fabric will be talking about at their event. Uh, biodiversity is a huge one. And the, the TNFD, the, um, the nature related disclosures that are coming out, which means companies are going to have to be measuring this. So boards need to understand what's you know, what's going on there um, in order to make the right decisions. And at the moment, it seems that there isn't um, deep enough understanding. So there's a, an opportunity here, really, that um, companies need to be giving their boards um, education on this and making sure that they're bringing in people who do have some knowledge on this to make the right direction and steer the companies in the right direction. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that goes to one of the topics I was going to um, bring up today. I got a wonderful magazine from my my university when I did my undergrad, and they have a focus on sustainability. And with their title and cover and focus on sustainability, you look inside and they have an entire page about how they also made the magazine more sustainable. Look on page two, you'll see the Forest Stewardship Council mark. Uh, we use this kind of ink, like really laying it out, all of the details about the how and the why. Yeah. And I think this is where we're kind of seeing a gap in mm. Japan, especially for how businesses are talking about sustainability. Yes. But they're not detailing the mm. how and the why. That's like, such an interesting point, yeah. Right, like mm. even even places that are saying, oh, we have local fish. Okay, well, you gotta spell it out. Why is that better yeah. than any other kind of fish place, you know? Exactly. You, you have local artisans doing it, yeah, but why is that better? Like you really yeah. have to spell it out so mm -hmm. that people understand clearly the difference between the status quo, quo the normal business who's yeah. doing business as usual and what you're doing, you know? Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's one of the things that, yeah, came up quite a bit in the panel, actually, that uh, sort of how companies are communicating their sustainability strategies. Um, and at the moment, the answer was sort of not, not very well and not enough <laughs> um, very often. And sort of so it's a sort of what you're communicating, but also how you're communicating, understanding who you're communicating to and making sure that this is going to make sense to them and, and will resonate with them. And that how and the why bit is really interesting. We did a, a workshop two days ago for a client here, so a German company based in Japan on organizational culture. And it, we had the sort of employees, all the employees together, plus the, the leaders in the room. And we were talking about sort of surfacing those difficult sort of thorny issues, that, all the frustrations and things. And one of the things that came up was, okay, we, we know what you want us to do. And, you know, it's coming down from on high in Germany and being sort of relayed through the leaders here, what we need to be doing. But we don't understand, you know, why. We're, nobody tells us why. So therefore, motivation and sort of engagement is that much lower. So that is such an important piece of the, the puzzle, right? So not just what are we doing, how also, but also why, why is this important? And I think that that ties into so many issues. Uh, the government is trying to reduce plastic bags, for example, yeah. like a very specific issue, but they don't explain why they need to reduce plastic bags, why we need to stop using plastic bags. So a lot of users you see going back to just paying for plastic bags because yep. the argument for why not use them was not there. Exactly. It was just a charge, you know? So yeah. Yeah, or they go to the packing area where there's the roll of little plastic bags and then they just put everything inside those, which makes me want to scream or cry or both. I'm not quite yeah. sure which. Yeah. And then, and then you'll see like a lot of sustainable tours or sustainable mm. businesses, but they'll still be using plastic bags. But they're they need to say why, why they're making that choice or yeah. are they not seeing that? Like, look at everything, mm. <laughs> look at everything that's happening. That, what yeah. is the image, you know? And then like now you'll see international chain, hotel chains in Japan, like Hilton. Mm -hmm. And they're tying up with my Mizu and they're yeah. saying we've got refill bottles, but even there, and I think they could do a little mm. bit explanation, like why refilling is better. Yeah. Why yeah. using plastic uh, water bottles is not good because of your health, microplastics, but also the environment. Like yeah. let's just make that argument very clear mm -hmm. everywhere, right? Exactly. I think it's very easy for those of us working in sustainability every day to assume that everybody understands the why, right? For us, it's just a thuddy may. It's, it's kind of uh, common sense, right? Why wouldn't you understand that? But I think it's easy to forget that this is what we do every day. We're so deep in it that, of course, it makes sense to us. But for others, it might not be so obvious. Um, and I think we need to be um, empathetic to that and say that, you know, people aren't necessarily uh, trying to <laughs> cause harm or pollution or whatever. They just don't realize the, the impact of their actions. Um, it's never been pointed out to them. And so um, I think there's a lot more that, like the, particularly the big companies like um, sort of Hilton and uh, other companies that produce anything, consumer packaged goods, for example, really could be doing to educate, um, you know, why we're doing this now, why are we, uh, you know, you look on the back of um, anything made by uh, Unilever or P&G and stuff, and it'll have uh, sort of made with renewable energy. Great, why? <laughs> why is that important? Or, you know, this packaging is recycled plastic, etc. So wonderful, but explain the why as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one interesting thing I also picked up from uh, Japan Times was how uh, they are starting to, like local government areas, are starting to list some of the daigomi, some of the big garbage, um, on Murkadi, one of the oh, apps to reuse and upcycle some of the, some of the big things. And so the, those kind of articles I love seeing in the Japan Times. Yeah. Um, but even underneath a news article like that, they could say why reuse is so much more important. Mm. It's not just to save money. Of course, that's important. But there's so much carbon. There's so much, mm. you know, problems with pollution and things by making everything from virgin materials. Yeah. That's why we should reuse these things. Um, we're starting to see trends in Europe. Mm -hmm. And North America, where companies are required to have yes. a repair shop. 
Exactly. So that you can take your products back and get them repaired mm -hmm. instead of replaced, right? So yeah. I think there's, there's a lot of great trends happening. In this yes. Area. Yeah. And I think, you know, regulation like the stuff in Europe around the sort of right to repair and things will will begin to drive, um, you know, change in this area, particularly like the large global companies based here that want to um, sell their products in those markets are going to have to get on board with that. And therefore, if they're doing it there, surely they could do the same here. So um, but it, it requires a shift in mindset, I think, both within the organization, but with the consumers as well, they need to to a understand you know that that's available and possible and makes sense but also um what are the benefits for them what are benefits for planet etc um otherwise people won't change no absolutely mm. i'll just put the the link here to the japan times article Brilliant. Um, yeah. about but it, it's wonderful to see japanese government also using existing structures right like yes. existing uh, online shops mm. like Mercuddy or using yeah. apps um japan rail is now doing a big transition from paper tickets to qr codes and and yeah. a lot of people who use the commuter passes they ran out of the cards so they created yes. a great online app version right yeah. so that also reduces a lot of waste these we can't underestimate them yeah. these are very positive changes as well exactly exactly now i started using the the app finally um a few months ago for the the jr lines and it's so much easier now i mean i, I i'm a tech luddite and terrible so I'd, I'd put it off for ages because it was nice and easy to have my my card i could tap in and tap out but then eventually i, I did get <laughs> around to downloading the app and it's actually really good so it, it just takes that shift right yeah. and overcoming the hurdles of the the inertia of oh you know it's not familiar why should i do it this way but uh, when we do change it it's, it's often we, we find it's rather good and it's so good for international visitors because yes. think of how many, like 3 million international visitors a month we're getting now. Wow. Um, think of all of them getting the commuter cards and then yeah. only using it for a couple of weeks and then that becomes a waste, right? Exactly. But now yeah. they're using the apps and they find it so convenient to charge from their banks, yeah. uh, it's a digital currency. So it's, you know, it's really convenient. It yeah. adds value to their experience in Japan, but yeah. yet really reduces the waste. So it's wonderful. Exactly. And I know part of the, the app at least is in English as well. So, I mean, that helps obviously um, travelers coming in as well who, who can't read the Japanese. So, because um, otherwise the, the ticket machines can be really challenging. You see foreigners that they're looking thoroughly confused and poor, you know, train uh, sort of rail attendants trying to, to help them, but not being able to speak the English as well. So this can make things a lot easier for everyone. Yeah. Uh, just a little plug. Uh, I went to Ogasawara at the beginning of the year and they did a little video of my time there. Oh, fantastic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> introducing some of the more sustainable projects and initiatives that they're doing on those nature reserve uh, protected islands. Um, it's really fun, beautiful photography. Uh, we're going to be talking uh, with the guy who went with me from Hiroshima mm -hmm. and he's an amazing photographer. And so we're going to be showing a uh, meeting for a talk in the beginning of next month, talking more and showing some of his beautiful uh, photography as well. But it's a fun little video if you want to watch and see Can you me, share a link? me introducing uh, compost toilets, which was Brilliant. one of the features of yeah. uh, the visit this time. Yeah, I'll put a link. Yeah, in, yeah, uh, do. In the chat. Yeah, and that's technically Tokyo, which is such a, a mind blowing. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a strange thing, but uh, there you go. So when you're going around those beautiful tropical islands, all the license plates are from Tokyo, Shinagawa <laughs> and other areas, which is fun. <laughs> um, also, I interviewed Ashley Souther a few days ago, and uh, he's based in Hiroshima for a long time. And we had a great discussion about peace education. He's a high school peace uh, educator. So he does high school English classes, but also he does the peace education classes, which is mandatory all throughout Japan. And he himself has had experience living and working in Gaza. So he had the students connect with students from Gaza and the Gaza mm -hmm. students actually visited his classroom in Japan and made that human connection mm -hmm. to the issues and to the people, which made it much less abstract and much more yeah. tangible to them. 
and um, you know, just doing an amazing job. He also has a experience as a pro wrestler in Japan. So we talked about that a little bit, which was really fun. <laughs> Pretty diverse portfolio then. <laughs> very, very. Brilliant. Um, so I think that's about all. Did we cover everything you wanted to talk about? I think so. Yes, we did. Yeah, yeah great. Uh, just one more little thing to mention. Uh, I am going back to Hawaii, home to see family uh, for a month this summer. And one of the things I was so excited to find is a big beach cleanup in Hawaii while I'm oh, there. Wonderful. So if anybody wants to join us in uh, Waikiki, Alamoana Beach, on July 13th, you're more than welcome. But I think that's also a great thing to think about, right? Like even when you're on vacation, mm -hmm. how can you engage with local people who have your shared interests exactly. about protecting the yeah. planet or mm -hmm. building a community that's, that's focused on? Plus, it, it'll be really interesting to see how they do it, how they do events, which I'm yeah. trying to do in Hiroshima, mm -hmm. and what kind of things they pick up. Like, is it connected to what I find? You know, that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. No, interesting. Okay, we'll look forward to hearing about it. <laughs> so I'm sure I'll be uh, sharing photos and videos from the event as well as other sustainable things I find in Hawaii. So it's it's always nice to compare, isn't it? Mm. Like when you go yeah. home or you go to other countries, you're always comparing back to what you see in Japan, aren't you? Yeah, very much, very much. So I'll be in London next week for work and meeting up with some of the, the sustainability network there as well. So looking forward to hearing about what's going on um, in that part of the world. And yeah, we can share that when we speak on the 30th. Yeah, wonderful. And thank you so much, Natasha, for joining and all your fabulous comments. Uh, she saw the most incredible documentary in the theater about the first woman leader in Taiwan. She's amazing. How wonderful. Mm. Thank you so much for commenting. And thank you, everybody, for watching. And uh, see us on the 30th. Right, Tova? Yep. Looking forward to it. Have a great day, everyone. Take care. Thanks. Nothing's wrong And I'll let you